Hey, welcome to the Noob Spiro Podcast. I am your host, Shrek, and today we are, as usual, going off to visit a spearfishing enthusiast and learn from their insights, tips, and experience. Today it's Duncan Henderson, a spearfishing gun enthusiast in particular, and today we get lost in the weeds. Now, every episode of the Noob Spiro Podcast, we head off to different corners of the world to interview some of the best and the most passionate Sparrows and dig into their tips, tricks, and advice to help you become a better Sparrow. So if you're new to the show, welcome along. Strap in, you're in for a big ride today because we get lost right in the weeds. Now, Duncan is a final year mechanical engineering student and this guy has spent more hours in a shed running experiments on spear guns and spear gun components than just about anyone I know. He's a guy that can flat out chat non-stop for five or six hours just about spear guns and uh, today is pretty good we get we get through a fair amount and hear a couple of his stories including three poo stories which is a real highlight thanks Duncan but um, what I liked in this is we we go over um, if you pick up a spear gun off a shelf what to look for um, to decide whether or not that gun is for you when you're in a shop in terms of common points of failure and mistakes that um, that, that, or faults, common faults that some spear guns have. So some ideas. We also talk about rubber diameter, shaft diameter, uh, common points of failure on spear guns like I mentioned, and uh, we do get right into the weeds. So if you're into it, enjoy. If you're not, tune out now. You've got my permission. But uh, stick with us. I would encourage you to do so anyway. Um, look, here's a review we got on iTunes from Robson91. He says, this is what I listen to every commute. I'm not with the missus. No better way to stay entertained than listening to some interesting Spiro interviews with these funny guys. Love their work. And, ooh, Kindle. We got a review on 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. You can get our book there. There's a, there's a soft cover uh, full, it's like a magazine, but there's 99 actionable tips in there to help you get better at spearfishing. This guy says, some great advice for all sparrows. I highly enjoyed and recommend this book. Take what you need from it and enjoy yourself. So thanks for Simon Clark. Um, oh, great podcast. Love to listen to the Aussie talk. This guy, MJ Higgs says, I spent half my time imitating the speech, hoping I can get it down one day. I love spearfishing and have been listening the last year, learning everything I can. And all I can say is this is the best place to start my opinion to make connections to other resources. This is the first podcast I've listened to with over 80 episodes that I have listened to every episode. It's the one thing I look forward to putting the headphones on to while working out. I know that it might be odd, but I can get more out of it if I'm busy doing something. Thank you, Shrek and Turbo, for everything you do to bring this channel to us. I'll be joining your Patreon account here soon. So, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for that, MJ. Uh, that's friggin' mint review, mate. Um, if you go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Sparrow, you can sign on as a patron and support the show. And uh, we've already got, I think, 12 legends on there now supporting us. We've raised $650. Every single dollar raised goes towards... Um, trips uh, to come out, meet listeners, do live interviews and things like that. We've got a uh, trip planned later in the year to go to Melbourne. At this stage, it's looking more like November, December. Uh, Turbo at this stage is not coming, so that's a bit of a bugger, but um, as usual, the show rolls on without him. So, yep, um, so thanks to everyone on Patre patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. You guys are helping to power the podcast. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Let's hook into this interview with Duncan Henderson. Adreno Spearfishing are today's proud sponsor of the Noob Spiro podcast. They stock a huge range of equipment that you can find in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and now Perth. That's right, spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range of gear. I encourage you to get along, use the code Noob Spiro, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O, and save yourself $20 on every purchase over $200 when you shop online. All right, good morning, Duncan Henderson. Welcome from New Zealand, mate, the land of the long white cloud. How, how are you going over there, buddy? Oh, pretty good. It's a Monday morning, so you know, it's the start of the week. It's the best it can be. You sound incredibly excited about it. Thrilled, absolutely thrilled. 
Well, welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast for the second time. The first time you came over on your way to an engineering conference and stopped by and stayed at Turbo's place where I was staying at the time as well. And um, we drank too much and tried to record some podcasts, but I don't know that necessarily the quality was there. No, so here we no. Go. I think what was it? it was about three and a half hours or something before we decided we should probably stop and a good bottle of rum or two. Yeah, it was a mess. Um, so look, hey, um, I haven't done one of these podcasts for a while, so I'm a little bit slow to warm up. But um, obviously, you're right into engineering. You're a final year mechanical engineering student. Um, you've got your own spear gun engineering company. You love just playing around and nutting out with guns. Where did this kind of this passion for, for it come from? Uh, so I probably started diving oh, what been now, eight or nine years ago and um, just kind of just used general whatever gear I got. Um, and then after probably two or three years, I was I kind of wanted to have a look into this rollers kind of thing, this concept that was kind of coming out and a few people were using them. Um, yep. And so I kind of saved up and I thought I'll, I'll buy myself all the bits and pieces and I'll build myself a nice little gun because I think I was using a one metre freedivers and um, when you had fish that were coming in and sitting, you know, 50 centimetres to a metre away from you, um, you kind of had to put the gun behind you to try and pull the trigger and yep. shoot them. So I made myself a, a little uh, 60 centimetre single roller gun. Nice. Um, and so that was kind of my first gun that I started to play with. and used that for a while and then didn't really like the way that it was set up originally so changed the bands around a bit and then changed a few other things and then decided that I could probably make my own roller head um, so I made okay. a double roller head uh, <laughs> and then decided that I didn't really like that one so I wanted to try something a bit different so I made a, I can't remember which order I went to but made a, an inverted roller head a double inverted um, <laughs> a hybrid, so a normal roller and an inverted roller, and then probably the biggest one was a triple roller, which was a double roller <laughs> with an inverted on it. Oh, um, wow. And they're all so entertaining, you, bit of fun. So you went from shooting a butterfish in, in 50 centimetres viz to to creating uh, hybrid rollers. Um, it sounds yeah. like you went right down the, the rabbit hole there, my friend. Uh, yeah, I got lost pretty far, pretty fast. Yeah. So have you always liked tinkering around with stuff? Is that kind of um, the way your mind works? you like to um, figure things out? Yep. Uh, so I um, originally did my trade as a mechanic and kind of worked on trucks and buses and stuff and then moved into different forms of um, research within the automotive field and did quite a bit of motorsport. And so there we were kind of um, pushing and, and trying new things and trying to work out how to do things differently to everybody else and work out why we would do things the way we did. Um, to try and get things to go better um, and so yeah. I kind of took a lot of that methodology across into spear guns um, and just kept playing. All right cool hey I'm gonna do we're gonna dig into some specifics with um, spear guns and, and some of the key engineering uh, concepts that you've kind of researched and developed over the years but before that where does your passion for spearing come from because um, where, where did that all start? Uh, so probably when I was little I used to go fishing with my dad and it really wasn't about kind of catching fish. It was just kind of more about spending time with dad. And then as I got older, I kind of wanted to try, you know, fishing and still couldn't catch anything. So kind of gave up on that and decided um, that I'd probably try diving. And when I was at school, I used to do underwater hockey for years. So I kind of had a good understanding of how to dive um, and I was reasonably fit. So when a mate basically rang me up and said, oh, we're gonna go for a dive. Do you want to come with us? I was like, yeah, sure. So I grabbed <laughs> uh, three wetsuits and chucked them all on and um, jumped in. It was still freezing cold, even though it was the middle of summer. And yeah, kind of did it once and then decided that that was what I wanted to do and went out and spent about a grand the next day on buying all the new gear and got me a good wetsuit and gun and pretty much everything and kind of went from there. You were hooked, you were hooked from the get-go. Did you shoot any fish on that first trip? No, nah, I don't think I shot a fish for probably like a month. And I, I think I started with a, a Hawaiian sling and the first fish I shot was like a wrasse. And I was just like, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a butterfish. And, but it was a bit small, so I was like, oh no, I'm not really gonna keep it. And then I kind of got home and then I was like, oh, that, that wasn't a butterfish at all. 
<laughs> but obviously you got hooked just sort of seeing it all and being able to combine sort of your underwater fitness and sort of CO2 tolerance and being able to hold your breath you felt comfortable immediately and, and wanted to get right into it yeah absolutely loved it just went head over heels for it and never stopped yeah awesome awesome well what's one of the sort of the more the more memorable fish that stick out at you uh probably my most memorable one would be um was a, a kingfish i shot probably four years ago uh, and it was using that that first little roller gun that i built when it was just a single roll of 60 centimeter and wow. we we're out for um there's a bunch of mates and we we're up out at castle point which is on the east coast of wellington down um, the bottom end of the north island um, and usually it's quite quite murky water and quite um, dirty but there's a big reef ledge that people quite quite often fish off that um, has a lot of um, deep water blue water come in on it so you can get a lot of really good okay. fish there and you, and you can get a lot of kingfish there um, in the summer if you're lucky and we decided okay. we'd go for a dive so it was three of us so we all jumped in and it was terrible visibility but we, we'd kind of seen that around this ledge there was a, a pocket of blue water and so we, we kind of swam around to it and we went from basically zero vis where we could, couldn't even see our hand in front of us to probably nearly 15, 20 meter visibility, oh, uh, which was incredible. And you could actually see um, like the silt line when you kind of swam too far away from um, the edge, you could just see the silt line and you'd go into it and just dis disappear. It was pretty cool. But yeah, right. there, was the, there was the three of us and one of the guys gave up after a while and went back. And so we were swimming around and we, we weren't really finding anything and um, we were kind of about to head back I turned around and there was this, this pack of kingfish had just turned up and I was sitting on the surface and I was probably only in about four or five meters of water um, and so about five or six kingfish just basically swam up to me and I had my little gun and I was just like I, they're, they're too far away I'm not going to be able to take a shot I'm going to have to wait for one of them to turn and luckily this one just turned perfectly and came and sat right in front of me um, yeah. so I shot it inside um, got a nice yep. good holding shot on it and it dove down um, and kind of got caught up in the weeds so I was like oh I don't want to lose it so I dove down and I kind of thought I'd stoned it so I dove down grabbed it and as I grabbed it by the tail it decided that it wasn't actually um, stoned or dead and kind of woke up and basically boosted it off with me attached to it dragged me along the top uh, of a reef and then down between two bombies um, down yeah. to about seven or eight meters so the whole time I'm trying to grab hold of this thing at the head and um, not really thinking about what's going on, but just trying to grab hold of this and eventually managed to kind of get my hands into the gills. At that time, I was kind of like, I've, I probably actually been down for quite a long time. Like it would have been over, a, like close to a minute or over a minute where I was just getting towards that stage. And yeah. um, as I managed to finally get my hands into the gills, I realized that my dive partner was actually lifting me up and trying to swim me up because he thought he'd watched me get dragged down and was like, he's actually going to black out. This was going to kill him. So. He gives me a hand, we swim up to the surface and um, Icky the fish and kind of scream and work because this thing was huge compared to anything <laughs> we'd shot before. Um, yep, turns yep. out it went about 18 kilos. Um, oh, that's a big fish, man. It was, it was a big fish, especially with a, a gun that was 60 centimetres. Um, it was considerably yeah. longer than the gun. And then, so I was re-rigging my gun and it was kind of a little bit, you know, a bit of adrenaline and a bit excited and stuff. And I realised that I kind of put the spear back in and then for some reason the mono was attached to my wetsuit and I was like well that's, that's, that's not right and then I realized that the mono was through my wetsuit and what had actually happened is that when I'd gone down to the bottom and I was fighting the fish is the spear had come out hit the bottom and actually gone up through the inside of my wetsuit and came out around like it'd gone basically up next to my chest and popped out um, in the middle of my wetsuit and so basically this fish, one, it tried to drown me, and then two, it somehow nearly tried to spear me with my own spear. Um, so the, you, you, your shaft came up through your wetsuit and, and, and out through the hood? Yeah, no, not quite at the hood, came up about the mid-chest, but it kind of went up in, oh. inside it and then came out through the chest, and I, I had no idea. Um, Jeepers. Yeah, and so it came right the way through, and so I, to the point that I put it back into the gun, and then I was just like, why is the mono going through my wetsuit? This doesn't make sense. So what, the back end of the spear went up your suit, you think? I don't know. I'm not sure which one it was. The whole thing was through there, but um, it, like when you, it, it brings up some interesting points. When you, like, I watched a couple of um, younger guys. Like, we've had um, mackerel season out here, and it's been 
it's been awesome, you know. I watched a few guys get their first mackerel and that. But watching people handle big fish for the first time is actually kind of um, quite alarming to watch. Um, yeah. Because like every, a lot of guys, when you, you know, they go for the tail because it's just within reach. But I, personally, I, I don't like it as a first grab point unless it's very fast. I like going straight for the gills. Um, that's my first move. Yeah. Um, some, some fish what's you your take on it now? You can't. Um, probably the best the best advice I've heard for battling a kingfish is, and you can do it on kingfish because they don't have teeth, but um, just put your hand in its mouth. Because um, if you if you can stick your hand in its mouth or shove your, your hand down its mouth, then um, it's not really going to go very far. But yeah, the problem is, is that if you grab the tail, it, you're slowing it down, but it can still, it's still got a lot of energy, and um, if it wants to drag you, it will. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, that, well, that wasn't my first one. I, I fought a few of them before, and, and I knew to be pretty pretty careful on them. But um, it was because I yeah, thought this yeah. one had been stoned, and it, it started to kind of um, yeah, yeah, fight yeah. pretty hard into the weeds, so that's why I kind of went down on them. Um, yeah, it sounds like kingies, it sounds like they do that quite a lot in New Zealand, particularly. Like, they, they like to sort of, they almost put on a show that they're stoned, and then as soon as you get a hand on them, they light up. Yeah. And... Um, I always go for the gills. That's my first reaction. Like with Spanish mackerel or um, you know some of the other pelagic species, you definitely can't put your hand in their mouth because your hand will just go missing, as you, as you well know after sort of spending some time in the tropics. Mm. But um, um, well, some so some you fish still... you can't put your hands in the gills though either. Yeah, what which ones? Some of the coral trout and stuff that we had in Tahiti. Um, yeah, you, you yeah. couldn't really. They're like the the leopard Cod, coral like trouts. Big. Bit big serrated um, gill plates in them. Yeah, and yeah. Rakers. So you could kind of get your hand in, but then you couldn't really get your hand out. So it was okay if you had a glove on, but if you were yeah, handy, yeah. you put your hand in there, you'd you'd um, you'd lose large chunks of fingers. So it wasn't. Yeah, they're a tough. They're a tough fish too, especially when they get a bit of size on them. Like, because um, they're they're not easy to subdue. So you've sort of got to get your spear to get full penetration, and then. Yeah. Um, pull your shaft back through so the flop is engaged but you've got a really good grip and then try and icky it or put the the, the tail between your legs and then icky it. Is that kind of what you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't shoot too many um, really, really big ones over there but generally you're getting, um, because we had so many sharks around, you were mainly trying for a stone shot anyway. So yeah, most yeah, of the time, yeah. you know, once you got it, it was pretty much dead anyway. Sorry, I'm, I'm assuming people know what Icky is. Icky's like, um, do you want to just describe what Icky Jimmy is? Uh, so Icky's basically where you um, you just use your knife or um, you can use like a little spear tip. And basically you're just driving it through the skull um, into the brain or into the spine just to kill the fish. And yeah, especially if you get something like a big kingfish, which, you know, if it decides to wake up and run, it'll drag you. Um, the faster yeah. you can basically kill it, the better it's going to be. But also, yeah. if you're in like a sharky environment, um, when the fish is alive and kind of pulsing and wriggling around, that will bring a lot of sharks in. But if you can icky it, um, then that'll stop it from fighting, and that can quite often um, stop the sharks from, you know, being as interested. Because yeah, right there's right. not those signals kind of being sent out anymore. Yeah, I, I um, got a little bit diverted there, but I just think it's an interesting aside because. Um you know, I've sort of seen it play out a few times lately with guys taking on their first pelagic. So, I mean, I know once I get my hand in the gills with a mackerel, you know, it's pretty much game over. Same with kingies, but, um, you know, probably the biggest one I've shot wasn't much bigger than that one you're talking about, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so the bigger fish are obviously a challenge, you know? Hmm. Were they, well, was your biggest one you shot in Australia or New Zealand? Yeah. Yeah. Nah, Australia. Yeah, so yeah. Australians... The, the kingfish there are longer and thinner, they're not as fat, so like a, a 20 kilo um, kingfish in Australia is actually going to be a really long, quite a long fish um, compared yeah. to, you know, 20 kilo kingfish here might only be, so a 20 kilo in Australia might be 1.2, 1.3 metres, whereas one here might yeah. only be a metre. So yeah, right. Oh. Yeah, because they grow, their growth rate's a bit faster in New Zealand maybe. Yeah, they, they fatten out, and I guess that's why New Zealand kind of gets well, why we have the largest kingfish in the world generally, um, with some yeah. of the models getting up, you know, 40, 50 kilos. So for some American listeners as well, we're talking about yellowtail, which are called kingfish in New Zealand, but they call kingfish Spanish mackerel. <laughs> yeah. That's a nightmare fish names, isn't it? Yeah. But um, that's a that's a cool story anyway, man. And, and what a bloody special fish with a 60 centimetre roller, you know, to, um, to shoot an 18 kilo kingfish. Um, you know in shallow water that's pretty cool yep so today it's still my biggest kingfish um and it's still the biggest fish i've shot with a little gun so 
Yeah, definitely got a good place yeah, awesome. Well, the other day I shot a fish with a roller that you built me, and um, I worked out I didn't even have much pretension on this gun. Yep. And so I'm surprised I, it performed as well as it did, but um, took down a 25 plus kilo Spanish with it. So um, your rollers definitely do the trick, man. I'm looking forward to digging into some some specific stuff and talk about rollers in a minute. Yep, they can definitely do the job if they're done right. Hey, um. Just just quickly, like, um, what's one of the scarier moments you've had out spearfishing and what did you learn from it? Uh, I've probably had, I have probably haven't had too many scary um, moments. I'm, I usually don't get freaked out by things in the water anyway. Um, but probably the, the worst one when I start to think back on it was when I was in Tahiti. Um, we had a lot of sharks around a lot of the time um, and you got very, very used to them. Um, like, I got quite used to, you know, you'd shoot a fish and you'd basically dive on it straight away and just wrestle it to the surface to try and um, icky it if you hadn't stoned it um, because the sharks would just be on it in seconds and um, so I've, yeah, I've yeah. kicked and punched a lot of, of sharks in my, t in my time a lot of them but probably the worst one was we jumped in one day and um, a mate shot a fish and I was watching him so you'd always if you heard somebody take shoot a fish you'd always keep an eye on them because you know you never knew what was happening with these sharks I looked over and this little white tip, it probably only would have been about you know, four or five feet long, wasn't very big, um, but he came absolutely screaming in from the deep and was basically just charging at my mate. And he, he was on the surface, he didn't even know it. And so I didn't really think about it or have anything to do, I just shot, it, um, shot at it. And he was you know, four or five meters away, so um, basically the spear just bounced off its back, but I could see it took a chunk out of it. Not enough to really yep. hurt it, um, but you know, give it the message, and so it disappeared yep. off. And um, so we were kind of spearing in the area, and about half an hour later, there was a, a fish on the surface. I can't remember what they were called. They kind of look like I don't know what they look like. They're, they're, they're not they're not very big. It was probably only about um, a kilo, um, but they're reasonably good eating. Okay. And so it was just kind of swimming along the surface, and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll take one of those. Um, I just got to make sure I stone it because I know there's a few sharks around. So I took the shot, didn't stone it, um, and so it, it went ballistic and it brought all <laughs> the sharks in. Um, and so the problem was is that, so I'd shot it on the surface and the fish was on the surface, and so all these sharks were coming in from all directions, and so I couldn't really, I couldn't really watch them because they're coming at me from the surface as well as coming up from the deep. Yeah, and, yep, um, yep. So I'm basically just point. holding onto the spear, not wanting to grab hold of the fish because they're trying to grab hold of the fish, and basically just trying to swim back to the boat backwards and just kicking all these sharks and just kind of stabbing at them with the spear and starting to panic because there's this one shark and he's just right there not giving up um, and he's you know basically at my ankles like I'm kicking him on the underside of him and I'm starting to freak out a little bit and then I realized that all the other sharks had kind of disappeared off and I kind of stopped violently poking and then realized that I'd actually stabbed the shark through the mouth um, oh, right. And as soon as I'd basically done that, all the other sharks were like, no, 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 we don't like this game anymore. And they all just kind of disappeared off and everything calmed down. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. And so I swam back to the boat, jumped in and um, pulled the shark in. And it, and it turns out that it was the same shark um, that had, had a charge at my mate because um, it still had the gouge out of its back. And yep. yeah, it basically took the spear out and it disappeared off. But I didn't see it again. So either it died or it learned its lesson. But yeah, I, that was the last time I, I shot a fish on the surface like that, I can tell you. Well, hopefully it landed its lesson, but, um, it, you know, while, while you were talking about, like, when you've got sharks on the surface and below you, 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 there's just too many planes of vision to sort of monitor. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons, you know, I mean, back to back with your buddy, it's kind of one of those kind of things. But have you got any tricks for keeping sharks down the water column? Like um, in terms of so they're not up on the surface messing with you up there? No, nah, not not particularly. I mean, my main experience with sharks is in Tahiti. For some reason, uh, I don't see sharks in New Zealand. Um, I think I've yep. seen five in like 10 years. Um, to oh. the point I've gone out and people have been like, man, there's sharks everywhere. And I'm like, I haven't seen a single one. And they just ignore me. They don't come near me for some reason. But in Tahiti, they were everywhere. And normally, if we, you'd shoot one down deep, and straight away you'd be swimming up as a, your partner was diving down to basically defend it. Um, yeah. And we mainly found that if you got down there and got in their face and was kind of like, nah, this is mine, and kind of made a good yeah. enough stand to start with, like, at the fish, they would quite often back off. But um, if they yeah. smelt the blood or if they got a bite in it first, you just, there was no chance. And, um, 
<laughs> that, that was yeah. the point. We just let them take it. Yeah, it's a tough one. Like we we get sharks here, like sometimes in plague proportions. But the last few times I've been out, it's been really quiet. Um, I've got the hex suit on now, so I don't know if it's making a difference. But um, uh, a few dives back, I had a bull shark. Like every drop, I would see this bull shark you know, for four or five drops in a row, but no one else was seeing it. Yeah. And um, I got some pretty good GoPro footage of it. But that's about the only issues I've had. But like the last four or five dives I've had off Brisbane, it's been quite quiet shark wise. And but it used to be like sometimes you'd have them every time. Every every time you get in the water in certain reefs, you, you would see at least three or four. So and they're uh, similar to the bronzies you get over there, but the dusky whalers here. So oh, yeah. it's it's interesting. But I, I know Tahiti and you know the further up you go into tropical waters, it's more reef sharks and they behave differently again. So yeah, um, we we never we never saw anything really big. Um, I think I saw like a, a big hammerhead one day, and it would have been about three and a half four meters. Um, yeah, but that was it. Like I was at, you know, he was about 18 meters deep, and I saw the outline of him. Um, otherwise, yep. probably the biggest thing we saw was like grey reef sharks, which might have been six to eight feet long. Yeah, so yep. there's nothing really that big, but there was uh, there was hundreds of them. So you'd you'd dive down and you'd sit on the bottom, and you would have three or four of them um, basically rubbing your back, kind of thing. They'd just be swimming <laughs> around you and over the top of you, and yeah, a little was unsettling, that- but. Um, yeah, especially when you're doing some deeper drops and you're really trying to be relaxed and all zen and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and there, yeah. yeah, most of the time we're sitting 25, 30, so. Sometimes when um, when I was out spearing with a couple of, couple of mates, they'll splash the surface when the sharks start coming up the water column. That was kind of why I asked you. And sometimes the, the sharks will it will make them a bit wary and they'll stay further down the water column. Okay. It doesn't work all the time though, especially if you've um, if you're pulling a fish up like and they've like you say, they've got a taste for it already. Um, they'll, they'll just keep coming. So, mm. yeah. Once mm. once they get that taste, um, there's not much you can really do to stop them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah it's funny watching people interact with them. Um, you know, everyone sort of has a different attitude towards them. So it's, sometimes it's funny to observe. Hey, um, let's move into Veterans Vault and hook into some specific spearfishing and spear gun engineering chat. Today I've got a sweet offer for you. To go with this free episode of the Noob Sparrow podcast, I've got access to some free courses. How cool is that? Go to noobsparrow.com forward slash Ted. Now Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving, a frequent guest on the Noob Sparrow podcast, has got several free courses available at noobsparrow.com forward slash Ted. Check it out, Freediving Safety. There's a full video course about how to avoid shallow water blackout, how to be a good buddy, all is the fundamentals of just being a good safe Spiro and it's all free. Check it out, nosparrow.com forward slash Ted. There's another one in there as well about how to take a 20 to 30% bigger breath, which will give you more fuel, more time on the bottom and uh, make you a more effective Spiro. There's also a whole lot of other courses there as well. Check them out, get a 15% discount, nosparrow.com forward slash Ted. Guys, head over to vimeo.com. Check out the How to Spearfish video series by Luke Potts. There's nearly four hours of video training there and they're divided into five different videos so far to help you take on the areas of difficulty that you might have. Now there's a beginner's guide to spearfishing gear. There's a guide to how to increase your breath hold for spearfishing. There's techniques for spearfishing yellowtail kingfish, which also doubles as a guide to hunting pelagic fish. There's a, a guide techniques for spearfishing snapper, which is a really good, um, helpful guide for approaching canny reef fish, which is a tough one. And finally, a guide to spearfishing around sharks. If you want to buy any of these videos, use the code NoobSpero and save a bit of cash. Check it out. Vimeo On Demand, how to spearfish. Cool, so um, I wanted to talk about band diameter starting off because um, I had a debate uh, again the other day, we were talking about um, diameter. You made a really compelling case to me ages ago that 14 mil bands were more effective than um, some of the larger diameter bands because of some reason. Now, can you explain a little bit about this this sort of this concept? Yeah, uh, so, this, this, well, okay, so the, so the theory that I'm working on at the moment is 
kind of proven and tested for a long time, but I'm in the process of doing some more research which may change this slightly, it might not. I'm not quite sure. So kind of keep an eye on the space, but at the same time don't take it as exact gospel. But the basic okay. reason why um, using a 14 millimeter over say a 20 millimeter would work is because band, um, the energy that goes into a spear from a band is made by the amount of force that it's um, that you can load into it at its maximum, say 50 kilograms, and then the amount of travel that that band goes down. So if it goes down, say 70 centimeters, um, say on a 100 gun, if it's traveling 70 centimeters, um, then that's going to be basically 50 kilos at one end, travels of 70 centimeters, and be zero. And if you look at it in terms of a basic physics model, it makes a triangle, and that triangle is about how much energy is in the whole system. So yep. if you can make, if you use a rubber that is thinner, then you have to stretch it harder and longer to make it produce the same amount of energy. So if you yep. say take a 20 millimeter band and you stretch it to say 200%, uh, um, yep. then on a 100 centimeter gun, that's gonna be 66 centimeters of band travel. Um, okay. So basically 66 times 50 divided by two it gives you about 170 joules of energy as an estimate. Okay. If you then go and use say a 14 millimeter, which you're gonna to stretch to say 300%, you're gonna have 75 centimeters of travel. So it's an extra 10 centimeters that the band is working on the spear, but it's still at that 50 kilograms. So when you do your numbers, you then go um, 50 times 75 divided by two, um, and that would give you your number, which off the top of my head I can't remember what it is, but it's about 185 or something. So basically yep. for what you end up with is you end up using um, the thinner rubber and it travels a little bit further and it makes a little bit more power, but the other advantage in it is that it's the mass that changes. So um, basically a 14 millimeter rubber is half the weight of a 20 millimeter rubber. And recoil okay. is generated by mass movement. So if you okay. can use 14s to make the same power as you can make with a 20, then you're gonna have effectively less recoil. Um, probably ah. about a quarter less recoil. So three quarters of the, of the recoil. Um, the okay. other advantage as well is, is that if you, you, can, you can either have a single 20, which is really hard to load and it might give you a good amount of power or you can have, what, which is what more people are going to nowadays, is you can have two soft 14s. And it basically means that when you go out, you can have either one really hard to load band, but it's quick, which a lot of the competition guys will use, or you can have two 14s, which are quite soft and easy to load, which you can still load pretty quickly, just not as quickly. Um, and those two 14s will actually give you more power. Um, yeah, so there's a, a few reasons why um, at that. So, so reduced mass equals reduced recoil and reduced diameter equals a greater length of travel even though it's still the same amount of force going into the into the mechanism yep. like it's still 50 kilograms regardless of the diameter of the yep. rubber because that's the, the maximum the mech can take is it? No, so the, the, simple, the simple thing is, is that you as a person can only ever put X amount of energy into a gun. If you can only yeah. load 50 kilos, it doesn't matter if you're using a 30 millimeter rubber or a 10 millimeter rubber. The maximum you yeah. can put into it is 50 kilos. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, that, that's kind of what um, your limitation is. The mechs themselves can generally take about 250 to 350 kilos, depending on the brand um, and a few little parameters and what they're made of. Some of them can be more. Um, yep. And that's generally in the regions of four to five bands. Okay, how do you find out what your mechanism can take? And how much should you load it? Like how much safety margin do you need before before you overload it? Uh, so, okay, so the way that I test them, so I, I built, um, I have a tensile tester at home that I built, which I use for testing rubber, um, knots and crimps and stuff, and also for testing mechanisms. Um, yep. So if I test a mechanism, basically I'll basically put a spear into it, um, fix the mechanism into place, and then I just continually add load onto it and monitor it all with a load cell and just watch at what point 
basically something rips or breaks or tears or explodes or or whatever and generally you'll find that most mechanisms um, will break at around about 300 kilos Um, and the reason that they do that is because the material they're made from is generally uh, either 304 stainless or 316 stainless and the material strength on that says that it will basically tear apart at about 300 kilos and if you ever okay. have a mech that it's actually maxed out and pulled out, if you look at the sear, you'll actually start to see they um, they cut a groove where the spear is actually cut through it. So, oh wow! Yeah, so that stainless is actually quite soft um, compared to the the spear itself. So the spears are usually three times harder than the um, the trigger material. Okay. Yeah. So what grade stainless are they using in the shafts these days or, or, or and what about the the carbon steel that they use often or uh, so I'm not exactly what sure what the carbon steel that they use is but it's it's a spring steel uh, which is yeah. extremely extremely hard uh, extremely tough and basically they, they're getting really good with the stainless but it's not quite as hard um, or as stiff as, as the spring steels that's just part of um, what it is but the most commonly used stainless material you get is uh, called 17-4 pH, um, okay. which is a 6300 stainless steel. Um, and basically it's, it's the hardest and strongest stainless steel that you can get. Um, okay. So some of the higher end mechs will have parts made out of that material, um, and then those are the ones that can go up to four or five, 600 kilos, um, which is when you're in the territories of your like eight or nine band guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, I guess this is why the shafts are starting to cost over a hundred dollars each. You know, like if you're paying for that heavy grade stainless, that's why where the cost comes into it. Yeah, so the stainless is quite expensive, uh, and then it has to be post treated as well. Um, so it has to be so pH on the so seventeen four is the material code, and then pH means precipitation hardened. Um, so okay. they then had to heat treat it afterwards to do some bits and pieces to get the strength in it. And that's kind of also why they get that golden colour as well. It's okay, part, yeah, of the, yeah. part of the heat treating and the process treating. Ah, righto. Okay, so we've got these mechs. A lot of them are starting to fail around 300 kilos. Uh, I, I, again, what's a good sort of safety margin for loading up a gun? Um, you know, how many... How, how, how much force is in, like, two wound-up 16mm band, bands, like, maximum, like... A big guy loading it or something like that, you know what I mean? Probably only about uh, 75 kilos from each band. So like a double banded, say a Rob Allen double banded with say two two really hard 20s on it, for example, might actually only yep. be maybe 150 to 160 kilos tops. Um, okay. So it's not actually that much. Um, Rob Allen, most of the Euro guns you get are pretty good because you can't put a third rubber on them anyway. Yeah. Um, so you, you can't really max them out um, or get anywhere near that. Um, some of the, when you get to the wooden guns and stuff, that's when you can start to um, push those, those numbers quite a bit higher um, because you can put three, four bands on them. So we're talking about steel failing with, with some of these mechs. Some of the mechs fail for other reasons as well and it's not necessarily to do with overloading. Is that, is that something you've seen? Uh, yep, so you get, so the, the most common thing that's, that's um, running around at the moment is, and what everybody's trying to work on is called galling, um, which is basically where, because the spear is harder than the sear itself, because one's a really hard metal, one's a soft metal, um, it basically wears on it, and you start to end up getting these rough surfaces, um, and yep. those rough surfaces don't like to, um, to slide between each other very well and they interact um, and yeah you you can basically increase the trigger pressure um, or cause the spears to kind of jam up or not let go properly. Um, Remember the first time we ever saw one was years ago with a a cheap gun and I think it was a combination of it It was a cheap cheap mechanism and a cheap spear and so the rust and the soft um, steel on the sear kind of wore into it and Basically, you couldn't pull the spear out um, without the bands being loaded. So you'd put the spear back in, and if you'd pull the trigger, it basically became a death trap because you either had to like stand on the spear to kick it out, or the next time you went to load it, you'd put the band on it, and then as you took pressure off, it would pull the spear out. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was yeah basically because it, the spear 
was had, uh, the sear had galled up and it, it stopped the spear being able to release from it properly and easily. Um, yeah, it stopped it to being able, being able to work properly. Um, so yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the guys um, are working on it. So Rob Allen has changed the way that his mechanisms are made. Um, so that he's and he's done a lot of extended life cycle testing to make sure that that galling doesn't happen in the new mechanisms. Um, yeah. So and then a lot of the other guys are more moving into um, using bearings and rollers um, in the <coughs> mechanisms to reduce um, contacting parts. So rather than faces wearing against each other, they basically roll past each other. Is it is it a friction based mech? Is that what they are? Yep. Yeah, they're all um, yeah. friction based. So the more friction involved in them, then the harder the trigger pull is going to be. The less friction, yeah. the less the trigger pull is going to be. So is there a way to adjust the trigger pressure outside of that? Uh, no, you can't change the trigger pressure because that's a kind of a function of the geometry of it, how yep. the ratios between the trigger itself and the sear and the spear is set up and yep. um, the contacting faces so you can't change the trigger pressure um, other than putting less force on it um, yep. so the more more bands you load onto it that total force then has to basically go through two levers like two or three lever sections to get to where your finger is so mm -hmm. the longer those levers are um, then the less pressure that you have to put on for them to work um, some of the older mechanisms were really bad where you'd put two bands on them and you might have a really, really high load, which meant that when you shot it with the single band, you'd shoot in one, you'd shoot it one way, and then if you loaded it with two bands, you'd shoot it differently because you'd end up mm. putting too much trigger pressure on it and pull the spear and the gun and, yeah. Yeah, you do the same thing with firearms. Yeah, So exactly. is, this another, is this another good reason to get in and pull test equipment? Yep, that makes a, yeah. Um, pull, pull testing makes a huge difference. Um, as much as some people are like, oh, you don't need it, you can just you know jump in and shoot a couple of fish. And as much as like I, I believe in that as well, like if you go out and you can stone every single fish you shoot, then yeah, you're shooting fine and you know the gun. But if you jump in with... <clears throat> any old gun or just you know a gun that you're getting used to and you keep going oh yeah, I'm going to shoot this fish and you keep missing it or you you keep trying to aim for the stone shot and you keep not quite making it the question that you have to ask is is it you or is it the gun and I've had some <laughs> people who've jumped in with a, a gun and they've used it for a month and they go I, I can't shoot the gun at all like it's not accurate something's not right and I've taken it out yeah. and gone out and shot half a dozen fish perfectly fine and put you know, great holding shots and stone shots on them. And it's like, well, it's not yeah. the gun, it's actually how you're aiming it. And yeah. basically said to him, look, take a, take a Coke bottle or a float, go out and sit, there's, there's a little bay just down from um, where most of us die, which is quite sandy and flat and it's quite clear. And so basically said, take that, tie that, no, <laughs> not quite there. Um, it's out off um, Mile Point. There's a little bay there, um, which is quite nice. Um, and basically he set up a little target and he shot basically a plastic bottle about 10 or 15 times and then kind of learnt how the gun shoots and then chucked the, the bottle on his float um, so he didn't leave it there, he took it back because he actually showed me where all the, all the holes were and how he was shooting it. And once he'd kind of learned how the gun shot and how to shoot the gun, he basically doesn't miss any fish anymore. Um, yeah. And so he went from not being able to shoot the gun at all to being able to shoot the gun really well. Um, yeah. And then. Uh, another example of how pull testing works uh, works well is I built a gun uh, for Luke Potts actually uh, with Aquatic Rehab and it was a 90 centimetre single roller um, with the reverse mech in it and I said to him it will shoot inch grouping at 5 metres um, that's what the accuracy is going to do on this thing that's my kind of my guarantee um, and conveniently we had some pull testing coming up so I built the gun up and I was about to send it up to him the next day and I said I'll, I'll pull test it and make sure it's working and if it's all good, I'll send it up. If not, I'll work out what's going wrong and um, fix it up. And so I went into the pool, and at five metres, it was consistently shooting three inches to the left. And for most people, most people don't shoot. So this is five metres from the tip of the spear. Um, so yep. from me, it's a good six metres away. And most people wouldn't really shoot that far to begin with. Um, but I, I actually quite often do. I like, I like taking long shots. And I shot it about four or five times and it was always shooting three inches to the left and so okay. I was like nah something's not right with the gun can't you can't use it um, I have to work it out 
took it home, had a look and found that when I'd kind of put it together a few things had changed and, and shifted and, and bits and pieces weren't quite right. So cleaned a few things up, got it all working again, um, went away that week about two days later up to the Coromandel and um, basically then just proceeded to shoot fish at four or five metres perfectly. Um, and it was yeah running dead on accurate and so he since got it and um, yeah loves it works really well he it's actually he originally got it to shoot snapper um, but he's actually found that it's kind of too powerful for snapper and he mainly seems to use it for shooting kingfish now um, yeah right oh. which is funny because he's got a 120 Derville gun as well which um, he okay. now uses for snapper instead so it's it, it, one thing is too like you get dialed in on a gun and even if the gun's actually a little bit inaccurate you've trained your body to um and your and your shooting style to adapt for it so yeah. that can be a problem too after a while um trigger pressure seems a big deal though like i, I notice um if i'm pulling still pulling then obviously i'm gonna i'm gonna shoot to the left yep with a, as a right-handed shooter is that what you see with all with all people with the with their having trouble adapting to increased trigger pressure? Yeah, what, what can happen is that if, if the trigger is too hard, then when you pull it, you're going to pull the spear, the gun, one way. And it's going to, it might not need to move much, but it moves just that little bit. Because, you know, if, if you move the muzzle a millimetre, um, you know, at your end by a millimetre, once the spear has travelled two or three metres, that's actually off by about a centimetre or two. Um, yep, and if you're yep. going for a stone shot or something, that can make a, a big difference. Um, it also changes the way that you, if, if you've got a high pressure, trigger pressure, you have to kind of pull the trigger from a different point on your finger, um, whereas if you've okay. got a very light one, you can do it on your, like the tip of your finger, um, which means that you, you're less likely to put force into the gun. Okay, cool. All right, um, so we talked a bit about rubber diameter and you give us your physics formula there, so that was handy. Um, what about shaft diameter? Um, what's your personal preference and, and why? Uh, so I prefer to use shorter, thinner shafts as I, if I can. Um, most of the time the guns I like to build are between 70 centimetres and about 110, 120. Um, I, basically the bigger the shaft you go, the more energy that you need to throw it faster. So okay. what I quite often see, with, especially with the big blue water cannons, is you have 10 bands on this gun and it's shooting like a, a you know, 10 millimeter shaft, which is huge. Um, and what people quite often don't realize is that the wider, the more you increase the diameter of the shaft, the mass of it increases uh, almost exponentially. Um, so yep. a six mil shaft is half the weight of an eight mil shaft. And I think uh, a nine mil shaft is twice the weight of an eight mil or something, um, or yeah, right, eh? pretty close to, pretty close to that. It's, I think it's fifty percent heavier. Um, it's it's a lot. It goes up a lot. And so, ideally, to keep the same velocity, you then need extra power. You need more power. So, you go, oh well, I, I want a heavier shaft on my blue water cannon. So it's already three bands, and I put a heavier shaft on it. Now it's going too slow, and it's not shooting far enough. So I need to put more rubber on it. So you end up putting more rubber, you end up having more recoil, and the heavier shaft and more rubbers gives even more recoil, and then the gun stops being as accurate. Um, and then, yeah, so it kind of ends up being a, a never ending cycle. Whereas if you can kind of stay with a thinner shaft, that doesn't, um, that isn't gonna cause you problems from other things, um, then you don't need as much energy, and so, my like I, I love a 90 centimeter single roller because I can run a six and a half mil shaft on it um, and because it's quite short um, it's actually quite stiff it's very very hard um, and it's actually yep. quite hard to bend 130 centimeter six and a half mil shaft um, it's mm. a so it's a, it's a lot easier to bend a normal seven mil shaft on a 120 or a 110 than it is to bend a six and a half on a 90. Yeah, right. Eh? I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, a, again, it's another advantage of rollers because you're using a, a shorter shaft. What about 
So overhang you try and keep to a minimum as well because a lot of Spiros seem to really like having that either three or 400. I know another guy that likes 500 mil overhang. Every gun he picks up, he won't even shoot it unless he's got a 500 mil overhang. Well, what, what do you think about sort of that? that you, you obviously like to minimize it as well. Yeah, I, I like to keep it as short as I can, um, mainly because I prefer that shorter, stiffer shaft. But I, I was thinking about it the other day, and I'm, the main reason that people would like a longer overhang is well, there's two things. There's one, a longer shaft is heavier, and a heavier shaft technically does have more impact energy onto a fish, um, so you, you're going to hurt the fish a bit more, but it mm. is going to travel a bit slower, and the, how it flies in the water is going to be a little bit different. Um, yep. So your long-range shooting might be off, might not be quite as good on the long-range shot. Um, but the other thing is that quite often the way people aim their guns is based mm. on the actual spear. So yep. I don't aim looking at the spear, I aim looking down the length of the gun, maybe looking on top of the spear, but I'm kind of yep. using the muzzle and the, and the handle to line everything up. Whereas when you've got a longer gun with a longer spear on it, you're not necessarily looking at that, you're kind of looking at how the, the spear is sitting. Mm, um, mm. And so that's kind of why quite a few people will go from using a long spear on a gun and then go to using a shorter gun and can't shoot it. And it's because the way that they're yep. shooting is different. And so that's yep. probably why some people like a longer overhang is because they're so used to shooting in that style that when they go to a shorter overhang, they can't shoot the gun properly. Um, so what's your preference? Short. Short and stiff. So well, well, as a rule, though, how, how much overhang do you have? Uh, the, the lower, the least overhang possible um, basically my guns if the flopper is about a centimeter away when it's closed from touching the muzzle that's about what I want so it's about yeah. 15 to 20 centimeter overhang yeah so I bought a Salvama Hero a couple of months back and I love the gun um, the handle just the the handle sits in my hand beautifully um, the Teflon rail seems to um, add a dynamic to it. Um, it's I know it's accurate anyway, and it. But my point with the, my main point of bringing it up is that the overhang on it is extremely minimal. Yeah. Uh, the flopper is literally like half a centimeter off the muzzle, um, and it's similar to the gun you built for me as well. Is it fact? Yeah. Um, different. The di the different places that the guns are built, you get different. Um, characteristics so the Europeans build their guns very differently to the Americans and then they build them very differently to the South Africans uh, so your Rob Allens and your Freedivers and your Spearmasters um, generally they'll all run um, spring steel shafts and their aluminium guns um, and they're, they're generally set up pretty robust and pretty hard um, but, yeah. and that's because the kind of fish that they're aiming for and they're targeting um, you go to mm. Europe and generally a lot, of the, a lot of the guns are much more, uh, I guess you could say they're, they're more refined and a bit more finesse in a lot of things. Um, they're, they're, designed, they're designed for shooting one small fish a day. Yeah, they're, they're designed for shooting smaller fish and so quite often they'll run like a stainless shaft but quite a thin one and they've got very, very thin little floppers on them. Uh, yep. So. Yeah, and, and when you shoot a bigger fish with those, um, you, you, you can bend those shafts quite easily, but I shot a kingfish um, up north a few months back, and I was using a 6.2 mil shaft on my 90 single roller, and the kingy yep. would have been a good 20 kilos, um, and he dragged me down and, and basically ripped me off in the reef, and so I expected that my shaft was bent, and I had a look at it, and the shaft was perfectly straight, um, and this mm. is a 6.2 mil shaft, so it's very thin, and it was a very big fish for that. Um, but he'd actually bent the flopper right back. Oh, jeepers. Yeah, so, so he, he'd done, a, he'd done a, a lot of damage on it, he'd, but he hadn't managed to bend the spear, but he'd definitely damaged the flopper. So I've um, mm. got to get a new flopper for that one. <laughs> yeah, the South African gear comes into its own when you're shooting bigger, larger body pelagic fish especially. Yep. Um, but the Salvamar, I'm, I'm super impressed with it. Um, have you taken a look at those guns? And um, I was surprised because of, you know, the Italian gear, you expect it to look really good and then perform quite poorly though. <laughs> yeah. um, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not being rude to them, but like um, that's my, been my experience with a lot of the European gear. It looks really good and it, it functions really good for a week. And then be, you put it through its paces, like actually shooting, you know, some bigger fish and, and maybe quite often, and they don't seem to put up with the workload like the South African gear does. Is that kind of what, what, 
What's your take on it? Uh, I haven't had a chance to actually look at the gun properly. Um, I've, I've kept an eye on it. Um, I, I've been watching it very closely. Um, the, the handle mechanism that they're using was one of the first ones to use some of the roller concept, um, where they use bearings in it. Um, yeah. They brought that, me that concept out in an earlier gun, and that was a disaster. Um, they, they got uh, it completely okay. wrong. Um, and I've played with that one, and the trigger pressure on that was terrible. Um, and there's there's a few things I don't like about the way that they make a lot of the European guns. Um, some of those ones, they can be... I don't know, I think there's just a disconnect in between the engineers that make them and the guys that actually People that actually use them. in the factory who actually make them. Um, uh, okay. So that's kind of where some things don't line up. But, yeah, I think they've... I think they've probably got it pretty good with that hero gun. Um, I do mm. want to get one, but um, they are very expensive in New Zealand. Um, yeah, they're a bit pricey, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> luckily, Noob Sparrow's got some re <laughs> really deep pockets. Um, yep. I mean, last time you were over in Australia, you, you got to experience the studio. Was that uh, overwhelming for you? <laughs> I was I was overwhelmed, <laughs> I could say that. Yeah. Um, now it's, it's very uh, homely. Um, it was, you know, and it had a very, very nice couch slash bed. Um, Do you remember up. the dust? Yeah. And you slept on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I slept um, on the floor. We're, we're, um, not we're quite all in the, dusty in the garage. environment, but um, yeah. 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 It, had uh, yeah. Oh, oh. it had potential. <laughs> so, you know, you're right, though. The gun was expensive. Uh, I think 650 Australian, I think, at the time. Yeah, uh, I think I they're about got... 700 New Zealand, um, which mm. comparably you could buy a Rob Allen Carbon for the same price. Yeah. Yeah, the Rob Allen carbons were a little bit dearer here. Um, I did have a good look at those as well. They look like really nice guns as well. I've been impressed with um, some of the guns coming out, and at the same time, I've been disappointed with some of the other really well-known, reputable brands um, and and some of the equipment they're putting out. I thought there's some there's some stuff I looked at I, w I wasn't um, overly impressed with, um, but but uh, it, you know, it seems like there's both ends of the spectrum there. Is that kind of your take on it too? Yeah. Yep, there's, um, there's always going to be new things coming out that are better and there's always going to be things that are coming out that aren't. Um, I mean, people yeah. try new things and they don't work and then they try things and they do work. Um, All right, hey, well, I mean, we're talking specific, about specific guns and specific manufacturers. What are some general rules that guys can look at when they pick up a spear gun in a shop? Um, what, what are some general things they can look at to make sure that they're picking up an accurate um, gun or or it's got the potential to at least be accurate anyway? Probably the biggest uh, and easiest thing to, to look at and I see um, with manufacturers still not doing quite right is um, basically pick up any, any gun in the store, have a look at it and see is the spear actually sitting on the rail. If the spear is not sitting on the rail um, either it means that the gun isn't actually assembled properly which isn't too common nowadays um, but most often what it's going to be is it's going to be the line release. So pick up the gun, turn the, like basically pull the trigger and um, take the line release off and see does the spear kind of sit back into the track. And if it does, most likely what it is is that the way that they're using the line release is actually affecting um, the spear. So basically they use where the spear is sitting as a gauge to keep the line release in place. Um, so that once the spears left the track, the line release will flick open, which is a, okay. a fine little concept. It works great in theory, but the problem is, is that some manufacturers, um, some are worse than others, some have been pretty good with it, um, but this basically puts excess force onto the spear and it can actually flex them up. Um, and so some of these guns, if you've already got them, the way you can kind of, if you, if you find this on your gun, um, is you can, if you set your bungees up quite soft, so that there's not that much um, line pressure on the actual line release. They'll sit quite yep. nicely. Um, but yeah, other ones you can see them are quite, quite obviously exaggerated. So the easiest way to, to see is basically just tap on the spear about halfway down the gun and if it makes quite an obvious clapping noise, um, it means it's not sitting on the rail. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so just looking at shaft and gun alignment, um, should they test the mech in any way or um, what about muzzles, um, handles, any preferences with regards to that? Uh, not really. You, you can't really test the trigger pressure on, on a gun until it's actually in the water and loaded up. Um, and probably the, the next thing is basically just to make sure that the handle grip feels right in your hand and that the trigger is sitting in a place that's not uncomfortable. Um, yep. 
I know one or two brands in particular, they brought out a new gun and a lot of people don't like it because the trigger sits really far away from your hand. Um, okay. Even though the handle, the, the grip itself is really quite nice. Um, and I don't mind it because it's really a, um, you have to pull on the tip of your finger. Um, but some people don't like that. And so, you know, when they go and use them, they um, can find issues with them. So, yeah, and fi finding something that's comfortable in your hand um, definitely can make a difference. And safeties only work when you're about to shoot a big fish. Yeah, and yeah and that's you, the best time for them. And you've forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. personally don't use safeties um, and always treat the gun like it's going to try and shoot somebody. So you never aim at anybody. Always very careful with it. Like if I drop it down and leave it and I'm looking for a cray, I'm always, I always know where it's facing so that I'm not anywhere near that and it's not anywhere near anybody else. Um, or ideally, I kind of face it into a rock. I was going to say one of the the biggest um, times where I notice dodgy shit happening is with new guys loading guns. Um, they just don't have that barrel awareness of where, of where they're pointing it. Um, and sometimes the loading technique's not quite on point yet, obviously, because you're just learning. But um, is that something you see as well? Or where, where else are guys um, lacking that kind of awareness that they've got a loaded gun in their hands? Yeah, I, I don't dive with... Um new guys too often but I have been a bit more recently um, with some and I'm very very aware that they're not aware of what they're doing so <laughs> I, if I call them over to talk Un the first thing I'm doing, incompetence. Yeah, yeah the first thing I do is I watch where that gun is um, yep. and luckily I was out with a mate recently and I was very aware of what was happening with the gun so I was kind of shifting away from him a little bit but he came over and I think I was like, oh, can you pass me your, your catch bag or something? Or, and he had it in his hand or something. And he ended up shooting the, shooting the gun off. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it, it wasn't aimed at me. I mean, it was, you know, yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of, you know, it went a couple of meters away from me in the wrong direction. But it was kind of like, I looked at him and I was just like, yeah, you're not, hey, not going to do that again, are you? And he's just like, oh shit, no. <laughs> It's like, make oh, sure man, you I'm, always I'm laughing, know what you're doing I've, I've made gun. some mistakes myself. Yeah, and it's like, if you need to do something with your hands and you don't need to hold the gun and it's on a float line, just drop it. You can just put it down, yeah. it's fine. Um, because, yeah. yeah, it's not worth shooting somebody over. Had an interesting discussion with a mate the other day because um, when you're using a real gun, quite often... Um, you know, you want to burly or free your hands up or something. And so he was going to get a belt reel just so he could clip off. And then I said, well, I don't think you should get a belt reel just for that point. I think maybe you just clip it off to your belt, have a clip on the bottom. Um, do you have any ideas for that as well? What, what do you do? Do you, do you use a real gun or are you still using a, 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 a rig line and, and float? Most of the time in Wellington, I will use a float line. Um, if I go up north, yep into Coromandel if I'm boat diving then I will change over to using on the reel um, but generally I uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not not looking for craze or power or anything like that or abalone so I don't need to drop the gun um, but if yeah. I am going to put the gun down to set a burley then I will quite often um, actually put the gun down in a specific place normally my guns sit yeah. slightly heavy um, so that they will yeah. either sink or they will sit um, and that's just kind of a function of usually going for crayfish where you just want to drop the gun and, and it works as a marker. Um, it's not very good oh. when you're in current and the gun disappears off. Um, I was meaning like um, like surface burly, so you're chopping a fish up or or maybe you've got a fish in and um, you just want to clip your gun off while you icky the fish or something like that. Um, so in terms of like having something hanging off the handle of your gun so that you could physically clip it onto your weight belt so you can free your hands up for just for a minute yeah. while you're laying on the surface. I used to I used to have one and um, I keep thinking every time when I go that I need to put something back on my belt to have that. Um, mm. You can get little uh, little like D shackles that, that fit that slide onto the belt itself that you can clip things onto. Um, or you yeah, can yeah. put a loop on there. But yeah if you had a little loop on there when you're um, when you're burlying or dealing with a fish um, that is definitely going to be your, your best option. Otherwise, I just kind of stick it between my legs. Um, yep, yeah, yeah, but that, it can be pretty awkward. Hey, noobers, it's uh, Jeremy here from Spearing Magazine with an, uh, with an update for you guys. Shrek and Turbo have been doing such a great job with uh, 
telling guys about Spearing Magazine that we've actually sold out of most of our back issues and catalogs. But uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, we have an international subscription available just for you guys. Yeah, from Spearing Magazine. I'm Jeremy Campbell. Thank you, guys. Go to SpearingMagazine.com. Check out the uh, international subscription. Aw, yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Patreon. It's a membership platform that makes it easy for artists and creators like the Noob Spiro to get paid. Basically, you support us per episode at any level that you choose. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Today's episode powered by patron listeners just like you. Hey, um... I want to move on, um, Dunk. I, I'm aware that we've covered about <clears throat> maybe 10% of your knowledge on spear guns and probably we haven't even covered a lot of useful ground, but I'm hoping we can just do a part two some, at some stage just soon in the future. Okay, but um, I, wanted to, I wanted to move on and just get a couple of uh, a couple more questions out of you. What's um, one of the funniest things you've seen out spearfishing? Uh, so, well, I've... I've I was thinking about this, I've thought about this for a long time, and um, <laughs> so I don't have any big stories, but I have a couple of, um, a few little stories that involve poo, because um, I know you guys <laughs> love that. Well, I love, I love poo Yeah, story. so I've got, I've got three little, little stories. Um, one of them was when I was, um, <clears throat> my first day diving commercial down in Fjordland uh, last summer, and okay. um, we just kind of, we'd been, we, we were diving for Kenna, and um, we just kind of worked for a couple of hours and then we kind of went into this little bay and one of the guys was like, oh, I need to take a crap, so I'm just going to jump up onto the rocks. And we're like, oh, that's sweet ass. So we kind of, you know, look up and he's jumping up onto the rocks and he's taking his wetsuit off. And um, there's a lot of seals around where we were. And we're kind of like, oh, that's a, that's a shitload of seals around here. Um, and so he's, ha- he's taking his top off and he's halfway through taking his pants off and the seal starts chasing him. <laughs> and so we're there watching as this seal is chasing him across the rocks while he's got his pants down trying to run away from this thing um, halfway through taking a squat. Um, Did he snap it ideal. off? Yeah, I think, I think he, he, um, well, he sucked it back in pretty fast at least. Um, oh no. Yeah. Uh, so another time was when I was in Tahiti, um, one of the guys who lived there, um, who I stayed with, he lived on a boat and every morning his routine was to jump in and do a little water berth Um, and (laughs) so he he did this he'd done this for about a year by the time i got there and fish are actually quite routine they have kind of habits that they like to follow and so it got to the point where you know it it was kind of cool because he'd you know walk out to the deck of his boat and he'd look down and there was all the fish there waiting for their morning breakfast and he'd jump in and they'd all just sit there nice and you know calm and sweet and then um you know, it was, it was morning feeding time, it was breakfast time, it's fine. And then the problem was is that after a while they, they started to get a little bit more... Invasive. Invasive and a bit more, you know, hands-on. Um, <laughs> until the point that they started trying to kind of, you know, take it before it was ready. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, he, he um, had these remora um, trying to, uh... yeah trying to take it before it was out on, on the table for everybody. So he kind of stopped doing that for a while. Oh, no. Um, but the other These one These are rough stories, man. Yeah. So you got the seal one, the remora one, and what do you got next? And so the last oh, one was... Um, I actually only thought another about Another poo story. It's another poo story, but this is, oh. this is kind of an interesting one. So this is one of the guys when I was in Tahiti. Um, I had a couple of guys come over, and he was... We were, we were watching his GoPro, and... Um, because we had so many sharks around, he was getting quite sick of the sharks. And this one shark came right in way too close to him, and so he just jabbed at it with his gun and just kind of jabbed it in the back, and it, um, it scooted off. And we were looking at the footage, and we were like, hold on a second, rewind it back and have, have a closer look. And when he jabbed this thing in the back, it shit itself. <laughs> and so we were like, okay, so this is one of two things. Either you stabbed it in the back and scared it so bad that it shit itself, or you stabbed it in the back and it thought, nah, and it shit. And then, as because as it, as it shit, it then kicked its tail and sprayed all the poo all over him. <laughs> and so either he scared the shit out of it, or he pissed it off and it shit on him. By the way, it was the third and compelling poo story in your interview today. Well done. You have outdone yourself today, sir. Three poo stories. Somebody else can try and beat that, then. <laughs> Quantity, uh, not quality. Hey, Doug. Um... 
I know that you wanted to talk a little bit about a Kamoka trip over with Josh Humbert. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. What's happening there? Uh, yeah, so so I worked um, with Josh Humbert on the Pearl Farm um, Kamoka last uh, two years ago now, um, and that was that was an amazing experience. Um, and so if anybody wants to go and um, do some work on a Pearl Farm, um, hit them up because it's a it's an amazing place, amazing opportunity. It's on a little island um, called Ahe, which is about 450 kilometres north of uh, mainland Tahiti um, yep. but we're kind of working on planning um, to do a fishing charter or a spear fishing charter out there um, so the basics of it is we're going to run it um, maybe around March April next year um, and it'll be pretty much seven days of spear fishing but it's primarily reef based and um, more about targeting the species so there'll only be okay. like four clients at a time, um, two guides. So you work as a pair with a client with a guide, and it kind of it's about going to different areas in the lagoon and outside of the lagoon and targeting different species, um, okay. with the kind of goal of trying to tick off as many different species as you can. Um, and the, okay. the cool thing about up there is, I mean, I've shot six different types of trevally there, um, wow. and I think I came back after shooting thirty something different species in the the two or three months that I was there and there was a lot of areas that we didn't go like we went to one bommy one day and shot three new species um, yeah and so that's the kind of thing that we're going to be working on is doing um, more of a personal guiding and kind of helping people to work through trying to hunt the different species and trying to um, learn so yeah trying to do it a little bit differently um, and yeah. then we'll be basically living on the island um, and we've got accommodation there which is rustic um not the the highest accommodation but it's good it's still nice yep yeah so how can guys find out more about this or email you or whatever yeah so the best way would be either to um to message um me or josh humbert um, or i think you can probably just go through kamoka pearls and just message josh through that on instagram um or you can message me through facebook or my um instagram which is speargun underscore engineering um, Alright, sweet. Well, I'll link up some of that stuff in today's show notes. So if guys go to noobspirit.com forward slash Duncan, then they'll see all of your uh, contact details there and they can learn a little bit more about this Kamoka, uh, aka Ahe Island spearfishing trip, which sounds pretty cool, man, especially if uh, guys are wanting to, um, you know, get a few different species under their belt, so to speak. Yeah. So, cool. Hey, awesome, man. Um, like I said, we're going to have to do a round two, possibly a round three, because you uh, love talking spear guns and we can geek out all day, but um, I've had a fantastic chat. Yep, no, it's been good. All good, man. We'll see you round two. Cool, man. All right. All right. See you later. Well, I promised at the start of the show that we were going to get lost in the weeds today about spear guns and spear gun components, and I hope we delivered. And But as I mentioned, this is very much a part one of possibly part six, because Duncan can talk all day about spear guns. He's a very knowledgeable guy. And uh, spear gun engineering in New Zealand, I'll link up all his links today. If you go to newspear.com forward slash Duncan, you can check out everything we mentioned in today's podcast. And uh, thanks for joining me. Really enjoyed it. Had a blast. Hope you did too. Leave us a review wherever you listen. And as usual, go along to patreon.com forward slash newspear if you want to support the show. Thanks. I'm out. Now, I don't know about you, but I love new gear. And spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range. Mad flat shipping rate, especially in Australia. And if you use the code noobspear, you not only support us, but you get $20 off every purchase over $200. That's right, pump in the code NoobSparrow at checkout, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O -O -O at spearfishing.com.au and you will save 20 bucks on every purchase over $200. No brainer. Thanks, Adreno.